I'm Karen Kaufman, and it's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Nate Fields. Nate comes to us under the auspices of Witness to Innocence. Witness to Innocence is an organization composed of and run by exonerated death row survivors. Witness to Innocence speakers travel across the country sharing their experiences of horrible injustice, endurance, and exoneration all in witness against the death penalty. Nate comes to us from Chicago, where, as I understand it, he likes working outdoors in his own uh, landscaping business and fishing three seasons on Lake Michigan. He says he's not up to ice fishing yet, and he may have chosen the wrong place to come to. As you'll see in his uh, brief bio, in 2009, Nate finally won acquittal on charges of uh, homicide, for which he served previously 20 years, or nearly 20 years in prison, 11 of those on death row. His execution date was set twice. Fortunately, his life turned out differently. His story is one of um, an, an immense betrayal of justice, but it is also a story that speaks to us of courage, resilience, generosity of spirit, and rooted radical hope. Nate, welcome to St. Paul's, and welcome to Ithaca. My name is Nason Fields, and I spent 17 years and 11 months in prison for a crime I didn't commit. 11 and a half of those years was spent on Illinois' death row. I come to you to tell this story to try to educate you about the death penalty and the pearls that come along with it. My story begins in 1985. I was arrested and charged with a double murder. The police took me to the police station. When I got there, they told me, we'll see you in 40 years. I told the police, what's going on? They told me nothing. All while I was at the police station, they was putting me in lineups, one after another. They were sending me in rooms and just telling me, go in that room. And when I go in that room, I saw somebody on a gurney that was seriously hurt. And they were looking at me. What they were doing was, they was doing a show up lineup that pretty much was illegal in Illinois. But they was trying to get somebody to point me out the lineup. Man, at the time that I was arrested, I was a member of the Arukan organization. Some call it a street game. Without a doubt, the government was trying to smash the group, or rather the city police was. And so they was putting cases on them, regardless of if they was innocent, guilty, it didn't matter. They was just trying to just get them in jail. So while I was at the police station, somebody pointed me out of a lineup. The cops didn't even tell me. So when I went before the judge for arraignment, after staying at the police station for three days, they told me that I was charged with two double murders. When they told me that, I almost fainted. Because the cops never told me that I was charged with anything at the police station, and I knew I hadn't did anything. They placed me before Judge Thomas Malone. Remember that name, because this name is going to be very significant as I go along. I was tried in a bench trial, and he found me guilty. Four high school students testified that it couldn't have been me. That was totally ignored. I didn't understand, how did I get found guilty? How did it happen? I wasn't arrested until 13 months after the crime had occurred. We asked for all the street files on the case. The police only gave us eight pages of police reports. And for sure, it had to be more evidence involved because a case that's pending for 13 months you would think it was 13 months of investigation. They gave me nothing. They just gave me eight pages of police reports, all dated the very day of the crime. We went to trial. The judge found me guilty. 
I watched as my girlfriend, who was pregnant with my daughter, run out the courtroom screaming. I watched as my mom just sobbed in the back of the courtroom. And we went on to sentencing. I had a jury for the sentencing phase of the trial, and the jury sentenced me to death by lethal injection. From there, I went on to death row. Now let me tell you a little bit about death row. Death row is a place where you're locked up 23 hours a day. In a week period of time, you're allowed out five times for one hour. You're allowed to go to religious service. Um, you're allowed to go to the yard, work out, or whatever you might want to do. You're escorted around by three guards with leg shackles, handcuffs, chains, and you're in a cell, five foot by eight. That's not a lot of space, but it's space enough where you can write a letter and just use the washroom, and that's about it. When I arrived on death row, when I first came in, they had a practice of when you walk in, they'll take the prisoner and they'll stand you like right in the center of the gallery downstairs. So picture one row of cells all down this way and another row of cells all across. Every cell was filled and every man in those cells were sentenced to death. So when they brought me in, they stood me in the middle of the gallery and all the guards just stopped and had me turn and face everybody that was on death row. All the prisoners I seen was just looking down at me, just looking me over, so to speak. And I was asking myself the question, this got to be a bad dream. I can't believe this is happening. And I was looking at the guys in the cell, and I was wondering, were all of them really innocent, like me? or were they guilty? That to the side. Soon as I got to death row, it's one thing I did realize, and that was the library services were very inadequate. The books were outdated like 10 years uh, old. And when you're dealing with the law, you gotta have fresh law coming across. You gotta have uh, fresh cases that's coming down whereas you can shepherdize and, and do all of those things. If all the books are 10 years old, you don't have good stuff to fight with for your life. And I felt that was wrong. I felt that was deliberately done by the prison authorities to defeat us working with our attorneys to try to gain our freedom and save our lives. So I started filing grievances about the law library. And I encourage other prisons to do the same. For that, the guards transferred me to the other death row in Illinois it's called Menard. I was at first at Pontiac. Menard was far worse. The heat gets up to 100 degrees. The cells is smaller than five by eight. You pretty much, you had to tip past the toilet to get to the bed. When you lay in the bed, you can throw your arm over and it'll be in the sink. I stayed at Bernard, I say about 10 years. Yeah. But let me go deeper into the death penalty and what's happening on death row. While I was on death row, I saw individuals who had become very stressed, very depressed. I saw prisoners who they were losing their mind. When I first came in, it was prisoners giving me a, a notebook to write on and an ink pen and some envelopes. These very same prisoners went insane before I left. Some were running around the cell. They hadn't brushed their teeth in 12 years, hadn't combed their hair in 12, 13 years. Some hadn't took a shower. They hadn't shaved. They looked like cavemen. Some would run around the cell in the nude, just yelling and screaming imaginary figures, talking to themselves. At night, I, I heard individuals screaming and hitting the wall. And I was wondering, what was they screaming about? In the middle of the night, somebody just go to hitting the wall like, I mean, very hard. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, what's going on? 
And the guys tell me, you better get used to it because one day you might be doing it. I said, no, uh -uh. I'm innocent. I'm not going to do that. I'm innocent. And I'm going to try to do what I can to stop them from doing it because that ain't the way to get out. But inmates lost their mind. Some who had helped me, some who had encouraged me, and it was so painful, despite the fact that most of these men were guilty. They did their crime. But the fact that they tried to help me, and I see them, that they had lost their mind and gone insane, it really pained me. It pained me. While I was on death row, I saw many individuals die. And they didn't die from the needle, you know, the executioner's needle. They died from lack of medical care. Many individuals that I befriended because they couldn't get their medication, because the guards took their time in bringing it to them, because the guards took it lightly when they told them they were sick, they died. I want to share some of these stories with you about some of these men. One man, Frank Bounds. This is a prisoner who I feel to this day is innocent. He told me that the police had tortured him. They took a telephone book and beat him over his head, and they put a typewriter cover over his head until he confessed to a murder that he didn't commit. Later on, it was found that uh, Chicago police commander John Burge had did this very such torture to at least 20 to 30 other men. But let me tell you more about Frank, because he didn't benefit from this cop getting found out that he was doing this. Frank told me one day, I looked at him, Frank, you losing weight. What's going on? You on a diet? Uh, no, it's just falling off. Maybe I've been playing too much basketball, whatever. Oh, okay, I didn't think nothing of it. Then I saw Frank a few weeks later. His front teeth was gone. His bottom teeth was gone. Frank, what happened to your teeth? He said, it just started falling out. I said, Frank, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. You losing weight? People's front teeth don't naturally just fall out like that, and the bottom teeth. You need to get the sick call and check it out, man. Check it out. He said, well, I've been talking to them, but they constantly telling me like it's a long list, and oh, well, it's just maybe your teeth was rotted or whatever. So he said, I'm going to still keep talking to him, and he did. About three weeks later, they took Frank to the hospital, checked him out. He came back, said, guess what, Nate? I got cancer. Now, my position along with other prisoners was that it's no way they didn't know that. Because when you come on death row, they give you a blood test. They should have known that. It's no way they didn't know that. But the mentality of the guards was, hey, we're not trying to keep you alive. We're here to kill you. So if anybody died in the process of their execution, that's money we don't have to spend. That was their mentality. Because their total neglect to helping guys with medication and setting, it was clearly obvious that they really didn't care. I say about three, four weeks after that, Frank was dead. He died. And once again, Frank Bounds was a man who I honestly feel he was innocent. The very cop, the very torture that he said he endured, it was a police commander in Chicago, John Burge. He was found guilty of doing that very thing to 20 other men. The exact same thing that Frank told me. I intend to tell the world about Frank, and I'm still looking for his family so I can tell them. Another prisoner, Bob Byron. Back in the Bulls days, we used to watch the Bulls on TV on death row. Michael Jordan was winning everything. And me and Bob, we used to just cheer him on every night. One day he went to the yard, and he just fell out. So. 
later that evening, came in, came back from the hospital. What's going on, Bob? I heard you went down out there. Uh, they say maybe it was the heat. I say, Bob, you went out in the morning. It wasn't hot. You went out at 930. Well, maybe I was walking too fast around the yard. I said, what did they give you? A couple of Tylenols. I say, just relax, sleep it off. A few days later, Frank dropped dead in the cell. He had an aneurysm. Once again, we feel like no way the prison administrators didn't know or couldn't see if they did the proper testing, we felt, and I still feel, that they would have saw that an aneurysm was coming down on him and they could have prevented it, but they didn't care. Simply because we're here to execute you. If you die in the process, so be it. That was the mentality. Another prison, John Posh. John Posh was an elderly white man who had the murder of a Chicago police officer. He was right next door to me. John Posh was very depressed. He wouldn't even go on a visit to see his own family. He wouldn't go on a visit to see his lawyer. He wouldn't come out the cell for anything unless the guard made him come out. He was totally depressed. All he did was stay in the cell, smoke cigarettes, and read books. That's it. This one particular day came, and John came out the cell to take a shower. All of us were shocked. I'm like, John, hey, what's going on? How you doing, man? What's, you out? He said, Nate, I had a pain in my chest last night that was so strong, it felt like somebody had their foot on my heart. And I said, oh, man, John, you're probably about to have a heart attack. And so the guard that was with him, the two guards with him, I said, could somebody please call a paramedic and try to get him to the sick call? Because he may be coming down with a heart attack. He never comes out the cell. All he do is just smoke cigarettes and sits in the cell. He refuses all visits. He don't even accept the mail from his children. Nothing. The guards say, mind your own business. I say, well, hey, I mean, well, they told me, they said, mind your own business. Uh, this don't concern you. I say, but it does. Because today is John, tomorrow it could be me. And I want somebody to say something if I can't say nothing for me. They say, you, they say, you need to get some rest. I say, no, y'all need to get him some medical care. So they ignored me. And they took John to the shower and brought him back. So I encouraged all the other prisoners to beat the bars. I said, we got to make some noise. Because... It was so many of us that was dying from lack of medical care, we had decided, listen, if they ain't going to look out for us on that front, we got to do it ourselves. So when these things happen, it can't be one or two guys saying something. We all need to say something because one day it may be us. So we all start beating the bars. We start raking the bars with our cup, and we wouldn't stop. And finally the big brass came back. What's going on? What's going on? This man needs some medical care. Well, what it got to do with you? You ain't sick. I say, well, hey, it could be me. It could be me, and it might be me one day. They went and got a paramedic, but when the paramedic came, they gave John two Tardinols, say, sleep it off. So when we saw that, all of us, we all started playing doctor. One guy said, hey, maybe uh, he need to burp. I got a, I got a seven up. Another guy, I got a Sprite down the other. So we passed it all down the gallery. Let's try it. We passed the Sprite down the gallery, and John drunk it. He said he felt a little better. I said, did you burp? No, but I felt a little better. And so we was getting a little perked up that, okay, man, it's not going to happen this time. We on, we on our game. That's all we had to work with, but it was like, we did something and he felt better. The next morning, well, that night, we tried to stay up most of the night and monitor him and make sure he was okay. We told him to leave his light on. 
but when we finally did go to sleep the next morning, we heard the guards running down the gallery, and we knew something had happened. They went to John Sill. He was dead. His face was totally white. He died of a heart attack. And the sad thing about John, the sad thing about John was about two weeks later, the United States Supreme Court reversed his case. They reversed his sentence in him, and they were sending it back for a new sentence other than death. But John never got the news. I want to tell you a little bit now about executions. While I was on death row, I was there for 11 executions. Now, the day of an execution, or the few days leading up to it, the visiting room is almost like a funeral home. Everybody in the visiting room is crying. And it's not necessarily for the prisoners that's due to be executed. Other people who were in the visit was crying because they knew that one day they may face that same faith when they loved one is about to be put to death. So the whole visiting room was crying. The prison that's about to be executed, I'd say three, five days leading up to his execution, it was tough for a lot of prisoners to go to the yard with them. But I would go me and a handful of other guys. Some prisoners just, it wasn't no disrespect to the person that was about to be executed, but it was just, some prisoners just could not take being on the yard with a person they have come to know for so many years, and this is his last days. It's certain things that even after I went out there, I asked myself, I shouldn't have came, but I'm like, hold it, I know this guy. We talk all the time. One prisoner, he was about to be executed in about five days. I went to the yard with him, George Del Vecchio. I went to the yard with him, and I was the only prisoner on the yard with him because nobody wanted to go out. And I just went with the floor, whatever, whatever he wanted to talk about. When I shook his hand, hey, George, his hand was shaking like this, and he couldn't stop it. I didn't say anything about it. I just acted like I didn't see it, and I held his hand anyway, and I embraced him. But it's things like that that caused some of us not to go to the yard with individuals that was about to be executed leading up to the execution. But once again, I always went, I tried to encourage other prisoners to go. One of my best friends, Ray Stewart, was put to death. And once again, the guards didn't want us to go out to the yard. This was one day before his execution. They didn't want us to go to the yard. They told us that it's gonna be a rainstorm, and if, if you guys out there, you're not gonna come back in. So if you go out there, you out there. You're not coming in. If it's thunder, lightning, you're not coming. They was trying to discourage us from going out with Ray Stewart. I say about six to seven of us, we went out to the yard with Ray. This was one day before his execution. Now, mind you, Ray told me early in that week, Ray was guilty. He told me I did it. He had the murder of a 17-year-old convenience store clerk. He told me the story. He said, Nate, I came in the store. I pulled the gun on the kid. Stick up. And he said, when he pointed the gun at the kid, the kid jerked his hands in the air. And he jerked his hands real fast. And when he done that, he said, the gun went off. He shot him. He killed him right then. That's just how it happened. Just like that. He said, Nate, I shouldn't have killed that kid. He said, but man, I don't want to die for it. He said, but I shouldn't have did it. I destroyed his whole life and his family, but I don't want to die for it. I told Ray, 
Let's pray on it. Let's pray on it. And we did. But the day before his execution, we all went to the yard, despite what the guards had said. We got on on the yard. We did what we normally do, played basketball. But in this game, it was kind of different than other times because Ray, it seemed as if he couldn't miss a basket. Every shot that he took, he made. Every layup, he was just making all the baskets. He was looking like Michael Jordan. And suddenly he stopped. He said, wait, stop right there, hold it. I know what y'all doing. And he looked at me, Nate, I know what y'all doing. Y'all know what's going to happen tomorrow. And you're feeling sorry for me. And I just smiled. I said, Ray, we just wanted you to have a good time, man. That's all. So he said, no. Play me the way you've been playing me. So when he went for a layup, we hacked him and whacked him. And we started fouling. And that's how we played. So. It was all good. We had a nice day on the yard. But suddenly the rain did come, and it was just pouring down. So what we did, we had brought out some garbage bags, and we made a Mr. Potato Man. We punched holes in the side. Garbage was looking like, is they ready to come in? Look, we like, mm-mm. We stand out there with him. So we had Mr. Potato Man. We walking all around the yard with Ray and talking. So. The rain, just as soon as it came, it stopped. And we made a circle in the center of the yard. And we put Ray in the center of the circle. And suddenly, we was going to say a prayer for him. And then suddenly, the tower came out. And he had a mini 14. He said, break that circle up. So we was like, whoa, they never done that before. So I said, oh, wait, wait, let me go over and talk to him. Maybe he don't know what's, what's going on. So I went over to the end of the fence of the yard, and I spoke up to the guard. I said, officer, now, you got to know what's about to happen tomorrow. This man standing in the center of the circle, he's scheduled to be put to death tomorrow by lethal injection. All we're trying to do is just say a prayer to the Lord to forgive him his sins and have mercy on him. And we praying that the governor have it in his heart to pardon him. We're not trying to escape, nor are we trying to cause any confusion. The guard was steadfast. He said, break that circle up. When I saw he had no understanding, what am I going to do? What am I gonna, what are we gonna do? We can't even pray. I went back to the circle, we held hands and we prayed. Said, he's going to kill us all. He's going to shoot every one of us. Cause we're gonna pray. And we did. He didn't shoot. And the next day was the day that they was gonna come and get Ray. And when they come to get us, they take us to this prison called Stateville Prison in the northern part of the state where they put us to death, they come with a helicopter, call it the bird of death, because every time we hear it, we know what's about to happen. And the helicopter came and they locked the entire prison up. And guards outside of the building had pump shotguns and they set the helicopter right in the middle of the yard, or right outside, right where we can see it through the window. And it's guards with shotguns and the whole, Oh, get up. The wardens and all the brass came down the gallery with chains and jumpsuit. And they came to Ray's cell. And they told Ray, per order of the state of Illinois, you are to be put to death by lethal injection for the murder of such and such, such and such. They said, don't try to resist. It'll only work against you. Ran the whole riot, riot act down to him. Gave him a jumpsuit put the jumpsuit on, um, 
They let Ray out the cell. All the guards held him tightly, both arms. They didn't walk us like they normally do, where we just had the handcuffs, the leg chains, and a chain on the handcuffs. They literally was holding each of his arms with about six to eight guards on each side, the warden and every, it was, they was just all around him. And, but they walked him down the gallery very slowly. They didn't force him to move fast. So, Ray came past my cell. I looked at Ray. He looked at me. I couldn't say anything. I didn't know what to say. So we just nodded. So they took Ray off the unit. And so later that night, we would all just look at the TV and wait to try to hear if it happened or it didn't happen. And they normally do the execution like around 12, 12.05, um, 12.09 a.m. in the morning. And so we all stayed up. And so we was waiting to see if maybe the governor might have intervened and stopped it. So it came across the news. Uh, today, Illinois had its such and such execution. Ray Stewart was put to death by lethal injection. And he becomes Illinois's I think he was the ninth uh, prisoner that was executed. When we got the news, uh, everybody was quiet, myself included. And the Christians, they said the Lord's Prayer. The Muslim, they said the Muslim Prayer. And after that, it was this one prisoner I don't know how he did it to this day. He would erect a banjo. I don't know how he done it. He would put together a banjo the night of the execution and he would play this song that all of us would just stand still and just wait to hear it. And it's one of the most beautiful songs and the most fitting song for that type of situation. And after that, he would dismantle it. So he sung this song. He played it, rather. And we all listened. That day, other execution after it's done, we really tried to stay out of the guard's face. Some of us would re refuse our food and protest of what they had done. Some of us would not go to the yard. Well, most of us would not go to the yard or the wreck because we wanted them to know, the administration to know, that we didn't agree with what they did. Once again, I bear witness to this 11 times of 11 different individuals. Once again, mind you, it's one that I felt was innocent. His name was Gervis Davis, and I'm going to tell you this story about him. Because I saw a movie since I've been home that reminded me so much of him. A movie called The Green Mile. This prisoner, he came to jail, a black man, 18 years old. He was charged with the murder of an elderly white man in southern Illinois. He could not read. He could not write. The police, while they had him at the police station, they took him into a cornfield late at night. And when they came back, they had a three-page confession that they say he wrote. At his trial, his only teacher testified he, he cannot read. He is completely illiterate. His mother was a, a drug addict. She didn't even see to him going to school after the first grade. 
He was just in the street, just floating around. Everything he has ever signed, he just put an X or a check. He could not read. But they had a three-page confession and signed by him. I want to speak about this prisoner for a special reason because, as you'll see, we felt that he was an angel. I don't say that lightly. This prisoner, while he was on death row, I saw him change from a young man, couldn't read, no sense of direction. He didn't even believe in religion. He didn't believe in God. Absolutely nothing. But while he was on death row, he taught himself to read, and he taught himself to be one of the best young men I ever met. He learned the Bible from the front to the back by heart. I kid you not. We didn't have too many books to read. So the Bible was one book that had so many stories in it. And the prison reverend, this is what Gervis told me, what got him into religion. The prison pastor came on the unit and would talk to him and ask him, do you believe in God? He said, no. Why you don't believe in God? Well, he hasn't did too much for me. And so the minister, the pastor engaged him. He engaged him. He said, have you ever really let or asked him to do something for you? Not really. Anyway, it opened the door for good communication between both of them. Gervis learned, learned the Bible from the front to the back. We didn't believe it because he would tell us, ask me any verse, ask me anything, Leviticus, Proverbs, ask me anything, and I'll read it back to you without looking at the Bible. We didn't believe him. We started asking him questions. There was about four or five of us on the gallery. We were just talking, and we'd ask him, Proverbs, verse so-and-so. And he'll read it right back. We'll say Leviticus 14, this, that. He'll read it right back. You got to be looking in your book. We asked one of the guards to go and stand in front of his cell to see is he reading something. Is he got the Bible there? The guard stood in front of his cell. We asked him a series of verses. He said every single one of them perfectly. The guard said he is not reading anything. He don't have anything in front of him. We still didn't believe the God. We thought they both was working in cahoots. So we asked Gervis, listen, come to the bars, put your feet through the bars, sit on the end of the bunk, stick both of your arms out, and push your nose through the, through the bars. <laughs> he did it. And so we started asking him questions then where we knew he couldn't see. He answered every single question that we asked him about the Bible. This prisoner, when his day came, I was in the visiting room with him and his family. I was on a visit myself. Once again, everybody was crying. Except him. He was the only one that wasn't crying in the whole visiting room. He was going around telling everybody, don't cry. I'm good. He was, he was consoling everybody in the visiting room. I'm good. Remember this, sir. Remember this chapter. Remember this. Remember that. I'm good. The Lord says, Are you innocent? Are you really innocent? I asked him, are you really innocent? He said, Nate, I didn't do it. I am not the man. But it doesn't matter to me no more about that. And it was like it was, it, it's, it was just too incredible to believe. But he was an angel. They executed him two days later. As to my situation, 
the rate of execution starts feeding up on death row. You know, it was going like almost two, three, it was just constantly moving faster and faster. And then they started executing two of us at a time. When they done that, prisoners just, I mean, it just, it pretty much boiled over. A lot of guys was just losing their mind. Guys wasn't going to the yard. They wasn't going anywhere, just sitting in the cell. Guys stopped talking on the gallery. They was getting quiet. And I would see that, and me, I would say something to them. Billy, you all right, man? Why you don't call down no more? You know, try to snap him out of it, like, hey, oh, oh, well, I've been working on my case or whatever, but I can feel the depression. It's just, it is going, the light is, it's like the light is going out. So then I thought, well, it was tough just as it was, but I thought it wouldn't get any worse. But it did for me because the chaplain appeared at my cell. And I was like, uh, well, maybe you want to talk. So I came to bars, hey, how you doing, chaplain, so-and-so? And he said, Nate, your mother just passed. My mother, she was my main supporter. She had testified at my sentencing hearing, and she told the judge, don't kill my son. She even said, take me instead of him. She would always tell me while I was on death row, nothing lasts forever. Say, son, remember that. Okay, mom, I remember. So when they told me the news that my mother had passed, I said, I can't go no farther. Even though I'm innocent, I can't. But it's like, Spirit of the Lord, it's like I just kept thinking, what my mother said, nothing lasts forever. And I said, well, this execution is not going to last forever. They're not going to kill me. They're not going to do me like the other guys because I'm innocent. So I sucked it up as best I could. It was very tough. I woke up one day and I, I went to, to the back of the cell and I was combing my hair. I had really long hair. And I was combing my hair and I felt this side of my head and my hair was almost gone. It had thinned all out. And I knew what it was. I was just worrying. I was worrying because I didn't know if I could make it without my mother. And it was just getting so difficult. They denied my appeal on direct appeal. And they set my execution date for January 1990. When they done that, once again, I was at my lowest point. My hair was coming out on one side of my head. I was staying up late at night. It, I wasn't screaming or shouting in the cell, none of that. But I was worrying, saying, I didn't want my daughter to think or feel like her dad was a murderer, that her dad was guilty of this crime. But I sucked it up. And I just called on the Lord to give me the strength to make it through this. And I said, whatever way that you're using me, Lord, I submit. I submit. 
So I said, what can I do to please God? So what I done was I tried to help other prisons. I wrote grievances. I wrote letters for other prisoners who couldn't write. I read letters that they couldn't read. I banged the bars. I became very literate legally. I learned the law very well. And I would show other prisoners certain um, things that may have happened in their case. They'll let me read the transcript. I say, I'm just trying to help in any way I could and try to keep a good personality under these circumstances. And a miracle happened. I was in the cell one day and a prisoner told me, Nate, you're in the newspaper. And I was on death row, I think then, about maybe six, seven, eight years, something like that. And I said, you gotta be kidding. I've been in it all this long. Don't nobody know me no more. He said, I know you wouldn't believe me, so I'm gonna send it to you. And he sent me the article. And sure enough, I was in the paper. What it said was that the federal government had indicted the judge who sentenced me to death. What they said was he had taken a bribe from my co-defendant's attorney to throw the case. My co-defendant's attorney was corrupt. He had bribed the judge on other occasions. When the judge realized that the FBI was up on the bribe because they had tapped the judge's phone and they came and sit in my trial trying to see if any money get passed. I didn't know anything about the bribe. I didn't know that the FBI was even in the courtroom. But they went on to say they was looking for the bribe to be passed and the judge knew that the government was up on the bribe so he gave the money back, found me guilty and sentenced me to death to cover it up. Judge Thomas Maloney. He was convicted in 1993 and sentenced to 15 years in prison for doing this. The judge, in essence, he duped the entire Illinois Supreme Court. He duped the entire United States Supreme Court, who all upheld my execution. That set the mechanics for me to get a new trial. Despite all of this happening, the state did not voluntarily give me a new trial, something that any right-minded prosecutor would do. They didn't do that. They continued to say that I was guilty and that I still can be executed. Of course, the Illinois Supreme Court threw all of that out and said nothing could be further from the truth. If the judge ain't right, ain't nothing right. And they gave me a new trial. When I came back for the new trial, they had me at the Cook County Jail in Chicago. And I was continually doing what I do, you know, help prisoners. I, there was a lot of young prisoners there. And they would complain about conditions. And I taught them about the grievance. File a grievance. If you file enough grievance, something will happen. Just keep filing the grievance. And I showed them how to write the grievances. Once again, just like on death row, the guards didn't like it. One day they came on the unit and they beat a 19-year-old kid up and I was beating my bars saying, get off of him. It was about 20 guards beating one kid. And I'm like, get off of him. He, you're gonna kill him. He can't breathe, he's screaming, I can't breathe. The guards came to my cell and said, if you don't shut up, we are gonna pull you out here and do you the same way. Eventually, before I left the Cook County Jail, because I was helping guys with grievances, because I always had something to say when something was happening to the next guy by the guard, something violent, they jumped me and they beat me down and put me in the emergency room of Cook County Hospital. That to the side, I overcame that. Governor Ryan had emptied out death row after a prisoner, Anthony Porter, had came within 48 hours of being executed and he pardoned four prisoners. One of them was Aaron Patterson, one of my best friends. 
we had made a pact on death row that whoever got out first would try to reach back and get the other one. So it was thought that it would be me because I had got the new trial first. But when I came back for the new trial, the state had said they was going to set me free as soon as I got back. But they reneged. They said, we changed our mind. We can do that. And they gave me a million dollar bond, which I couldn't make. So when they let my friend out, the governor, we made a pact, whoever get out first, or try to reach for the other one. He got a state compensation, $199,000. And he immediately came down to the Cook County Jail and bond me out for a million dollar bond. That was a really beautiful moment because both of us was innocent on death row. And it took another exonerated death row prisoner to reach for me. When the guards told me I was bonded out, I was like, okay. When I got all the way down, they said, pack your stuff. I was still like, I felt like I was dreaming because I was so afraid, oh, something was going to happen on the way out that, oh, we made a mistake, go back. I got to the last door, and the guard, he had me sign something. And he didn't say nothing else. I was just standing there by myself, no guards all around me or none of that. And I said, what's the next step? He said, you can go. Just walk out that door. I walked out the door, and I was walking through the lot of the county jail, and I smelled something that I know I had to smell. And it was a tree. And I looked up, and I was looking up, I almost tripped and fell, I almost tripped and fell right on my face because it had dawned on me. I, had, I hadn't been under a tree in 17 and a half. So I, I almost fell because I hadn't been under a tree in so long. I had forgot what it was like. So I almost fell. And I was kind of still kind of used to the guards escorting me around. So I regained my balance. And I walked into the little street area. And I walked out. And then all the press made, met me and whatnot. After I was set free, it was a lot of things I had to learn all over again like a child. I couldn't even cross the street. I was, mind you, I was very fit on death row. I, I worked out on the yard. We would be in the cell doing push-ups, counting them off, just doing stuff. Staying in good shape. I never smoked cigarettes, no drugs, no women. So I was pretty much just on the rocks, on ice. <laughs> so, so. I couldn't really cross the street, and I didn't realize it until I realized it. My timing was off. I look at the cars. I wasn't used to cars being right here. Like I, I. So what I did after the first car almost hit me, I tried to keep my little nephews with me because I stayed with my sister's house. And my little nephews was like eight, nine years old. They didn't know. They're, they're older now, and I told them, but they was like my eyes. And so I had one here and one there. And I wait till they move. When the light changed and I walk. I didn't want them to know that I couldn't do it. <laughs> After that, I represented myself on my certificate of innocence. Certificate of innocence is a legal document declaring legally you are innocent. I represented myself on my certificate of innocence hearing before the very prosecutors who was trying to put me back on death row, and I won, and gained my own exoneration. That's never happened before. Praise the Lord. After that, I filed one of the largest lawsuits in Illinois' history against the prosecutors and the police who framed me up and set the stage for me to be in front of this corrupt judge. That lawsuit is still pending. The next thing is that I would like to share with you guys 
the death penalty itself. After I was released and exonerated, I hooked up with a group called Witness to Innocence. Witness to Innocence is a group of exonerated death row prisoners from across the nation who come together to tell their story across the nation and abroad in other lands to try to educate people and tell people about the intricacies of the death penalty and what we went through here in the United States on death row. At this current time, I am a board member of Witness to Innocence, and I'm the chairman of the Federal Compensation Committee. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Our position, which is really my position, the death penalty is not good for the citizens of the United States because of one factor. You don't have to go no farther than the human factor. This is what I tell everybody, everywhere I go, the human factor. We all make mistakes. It is undeniable that everybody in this room has made some form of a mistake in their lifetime because none of us are perfect. When you're dealing with the death penalty, it's a penalty that it is no room for a mistake. It is not no room for an error. We see it all the time in a baseball game. The guy slides in the second base, he's out. That guy can go to the dugout. On further review, he really was safe. He can come back out the dugout, but with the death penalty, you can't come back. You can't bring a man back from the graveyard. We all make mistakes. We must come to grip to it. There has been 138 death row exonerees across the nation. You would think when you look at Toyota, when they had a malfunction in some of their vehicles, they did a total recall, shut down everything. You would think 138 times that people was put in harm's way who did not do the crime. It is only through the grace of God that they made it through that. You would think that we would say, shut it down. That's it. Because one life that's lost innocent is too many. Because that one life, it shapes the throne of God. He feels it. So we can't be concerned with numbers, none of that. But that's not happening here. So we, the members of Witness to Innocence, we're here to, to inform. We're here to teach. We're here to educate you, the citizens of this great state, this great country, what the death penalty is really about. Today, it was me, Nathan Fields, who almost lost my life. Tomorrow, it can be either one of you. It can be either one of your children, your sister, your brother. Thank you very much.